As you know, our guest speaker today is Dr. Robert Reich. Dr. Reich, welcome. Part of your work that maybe interests me the most is the part that has to do with what you've learned about putting things into practice. You may not know how to do it, but in this country, in this age, there is more possibility for grassroots political, social, economic action than probably any age, any economy, any country in history. Okay, and say a little bit about accessing that. Let's take it, let's make it very personal. You've got, you've got certain ways you see that things could be made to work more effectively. My, my personal ability to affect change has to do with my role as a teacher. Now, other people have other strengths. They may not know that they have the strengths. They do have other strengths. And I think that uh, it's possible to exert enormous leadership in the society, not being a leader, not being a formal leader, mm -hmm. but being a person who has a vision, who has some common sense, who has some power, feels the power, uses the power. You are an example, I assume. Yeah, uh, really, I am. Not, uh, a set, not, not so much an example of power, but an example of the possibility of power. I certainly have nothing in my background uh, that puts any power into my hands uh, in any automatic way. And what I liked about what you said was something like owning up to the power you've got, or taking ownership of it and responsibility for it. I mean, I liked the flavor of what you were saying and I'm going to ask you to deal with something which I'm asked to deal with, because I may learn something in how to deal with it. Uh, there is the obvious and obviously cynical response, which says, yes, but uh, really it's the guys and gals in Congress, or it's the power brokers in industry, or it's the, uh, I can't think of the right pejorative word for the labor leaders, or uh, it's, it's, it's somebody's got somebody's up there with a great deal of power yeah somebody's pulling the strings yeah and and the cynic will say but look you as an individual don't have anything to do with it you're like a uh, you know you're like the wind howling nothing see that's that's one of the that, that's not true that's profoundly not true Warner I hang around I hang around Congress I spent uh, almost 10 years in Washington individual Congress people have almost no power at all I mean, you go around, spend a day with an individual member of Congress, and they are run ragged. They have people claiming pieces of their time. They have to worry about the next election. They worry about fundraisers. They have to worry about doing this for this person and that for that person. There's almost no, if we're talking about power as discretion, power as discretion to affect something, there's almost no discretion there. Power has a lot to do with leadership, and leadership is different from authority. You can be a leader by being anyone, anywhere. If people say, you know, he has something. He's saying something true. He's saying something very important. He's saying something that reaches me. That's a leader. Now, uh, again, what I, what I try to do in my writings, not only to put things in a way that are meaningful to people, but also put things in a way that are slightly provocative, that shake people up a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you shake people up too much that they don't follow you at all. But if you shake them up a little bit, enough so that they're intrigued, they're not too threatened, and they're at least willing to suspend disbelief for a moment, to read and think about what you're saying, then I think there's a potential for leadership. Okay, now you're right in the area, this is one of the areas that I, I want to keep pushing us in the conversation, Bob. I hear you saying that if you want to, if you want to have some impact on the culture and society, that there's something valid about a provocative but within the bounds that people can tolerate so there's a certain judgment there about how far to go am I following yes and yes, would you yes. say some more about how you how you develop that judgment how you developed that I, judgment well it, it's it's a little bit hard to say Werner. I, I, I think that uh, certain things I've written certain things that I've taught have been too provocative and I can tell they're too provocative because uh, either people don't listen they just put up their walls. Mm -hmm. They will say, no, I, that is so dissonant with what I believe and what I understand about the world that I, it's too painful for me to even hear what you're saying. In order to understand reality, 
all of us carry around in our heads uh, little boxes in which we place everything. And this is either, uh, whether you're talking about, this is manufacturing, this is services. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, 19th century, this is 20th century, this is uh, black, this is white. But in order to affect social change, you've got to shake people loose from those from old those categories, categories. Yeah. and those boxes. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you don't do it by simply saying to them, look at my new box. <laughs> because they, you can't, you know, you just, that people don't want to look at a new, <laughs> new category. <laughs> right. They're comfortable. They've invested a lot of time and energy and psychic energy trying to get the old categories. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very, very difficult to get people to accept the new categories directly. And I think what you have to do Listen, is... Listen, I want to interrupt for a second because mm. I want you to know, you know, in the normal course of events, there's a part of a conversation where you're, you know, you just have to have that part to get to the next part. And then there's parts that are interesting. What you're talking about now is neither of those two things. This is new what my life is about. <laughs> so you want, you want to know you've got to... what my life is about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, this is deep. This is really yeah. deep. This is, this is the basic me. And uh, this keeps uh, me up at night. Well, it, it, uh, it, it does me too, Warner. And I, uh, again, I, I get great solace out of teaching. I mean, actually, in the classroom teaching, because I can do something that I can't normally do in print. Yes. When I, when I have people in my classroom, I can actually watch them. I can look at their faces. And I can say things. And I can look at their body language. And I can look at how they how they're processing it, and I can experiment different ways of saying it, different, uh, different ways of making it not so threatening that they don't hear, but sufficiently provocative that they're not bored. Yeah, and Bob, I hear you saying, implying, that in the classroom you can speak in the language of categories, whereas in the public conversation it's more difficult to speak in the language of categories. You've kind of got to speak as though you've got a new answer in the old categories. And I'm, I want to push on this. Well, let me, let, me, let me push a little bit on that. In order to discover the way in which you can reach out to people who have a lot invested in the old categories and make them see that their old categories might be wrong, or at least take the chance, take the risk of suspending those old categories for a moment mm. and thinking about new categories. In order to get people to do that, in order, you've got to do a lot of experimenting. Uh -huh. You've got to get the right images, the right examples, the right illustrations, the right, uh, the right words. Uh, you have to know how high you can turn up the heat without people getting threatened and turning you off. And I find that the classroom is a terrific laboratory for that because the classroom gives me so much feedback. I watch the faces very carefully. I mean, I would love to watch your faces. I can't do that. I'm talking to Werner. Sorry. sorry. Uh, but uh, but I, I watch the faces very, very carefully, and I watch the, the body language, and I, see, uh, and I see how people are responding. And over time, it helps me develop a repertoire of examples, illustrations, uh, words, images, ways of turning the heat up just to the right amount. And we're talking about a very careful calibration of heat. Again, too much heat, people don't listen. Too little heat, they don't listen. It's got to be just at the right amount. Bob, what, um, one of the things that I struggle with is that it seems to me that the... Well, let me, let me give you an example, point blank. I find that when I'm in the communicating, dealing with, inquiring into the category, as contrasted with the content, that there are certain ways of speaking that there are certain ways of speaking on which we ordinarily depend for understanding, explanation and understanding, that are actually too weak in the category area. Mm -hmm. For example, I have a suspicion for too much metaphor when you're attempting to convey category and not content. Any experience in that arena? Anything you can say? Well, one thing you can do to help people, I've found, is to make them aware of the metaphors they use already mm -hmm. and how weak those metaphors are. Mm -hmm. 
Now, take the metaphor of free trade, or free markets. That's yeah. even a better metaphor. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, a free market. Now, the word free as an adjective is wonderful. We love free. Yeah, it's great. I love a free. <laughs> I very, it gets me very, uh, I feel loose. And, and a market, and a market sounds nice because you have a, you, you think about a marketplace, a little uh, town center where people come and bring their things. <laughs> and a free market sounds absolutely wonderful. And a lot of economists uh, like, to, like to talk about a free market as a category. And there's either free market or there's government. Now, what they, what I do sometimes is I, is I unpack the words. Uh, right now, a lot of uh, politicians, uh, Richard Gephardt, parading around New Hampshire, for example, are worried about dumped goods, dumping, foreign dumping of goods in the United States. Right. Dumping. Bob, say what dumping is so that we all have the same understanding. Well, dumping, I mean, under the trade laws, dumping is selling something here uh, at less than fair market value. In other words... What is fair market value? <laughs> What is dumping? I mean, dumping sounds terrible. Most people who listen to politicians say, we've got to stop those Koreans from dumping goods in the United States. They say, of course we have to stop them from dumping uh, goods dumping's in the United States. Dumping's obviously Dumping, bad, right? it, sounds like you're, it, sounds like they're, it sounds like they're bringing a, a truck up to our shores and up tilting the carriage and depositing fecal material all over, right? right? Dumping, exactly. ugh. Well, American consumers have a slightly less pejorative term for dumped goods. Right. They're called bargains. <laughs> same goods. The by same the way. goods, but they <laughs> now again if you if you unpack these metaphors, you find that what we're really talking about is a foreigner who wants to sell something in the United States very, very cheaply. Sometimes more cheaply than Americans would like it to be sold, and sometimes more cheaply than American firms who are producing with similar resources could possibly produce, and even sometimes more cheaply than the foreigner might sell it in the home market. No. Is that bad? Maybe under certain circumstances, maybe good under certain circumstances. But American firms do that in American, our own markets. American firms always do it in our own markets. But by unpacking the term dumping, and yeah. forcing people to recognize what it is that we're you have the opportunity, you create opportunities for new categories, yeah. for new boxes. Very good. Very clear. Very nice. Uh, this is a series on creativity, and in the normal course of events, at least I, uh, associate creativity with something individualistic, something personal. Maybe you might get a creative team, but a creative committee, that's an oxymoron almost. Um, yet, in reading your work and in doing a little studying of your work, what began to come out for me is that you're talking about being creative culturally, so to speak. Uh, and I'd like to get into this idea that a culture actually might have the power to be creative with regard to itself, so to, to invent itself, so to speak, not to be left with what it already but not to be left with what it inherited and merely polishing, but maybe creating new cultural pathways, new cultural possibilities. I'd like you to talk. Well, it's very connected to our previous conversation, yeah. what we were just talking about in terms of the boxes, Warner, because if enough people in a culture have the capacity to step back from the culture and look at it, just like you step back from yourself and examine yourself, then you have the possibilities of change. You don't have any possibility of change when people are unwilling or unable to step back, when, when everything is taken for granted, when everything around them is assumed to be natural and inevitable, no. when all the boxes are fixed, then people cannot, cannot make uh, new, new things happen. Creativity, I think, whether you're talking about an individual or a team or a culture, is very much a function of the of the ability to ask the most obvious questions in the world about what seems to be the most obvious things in the world and do it with a straight face <laughs> and do it sincerely and ask yourself and even if you come up with an obvious answer that's the first step toward wisdom <laughs>